The following program is made possible by Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo, the next stage. The San Francisco 49ers are heading into a new season with a whole new brain trust in charge of the team. Is optimism finally the order of the day at 49-49 DeBartolo Way? We cover this as so much more with one of the leading voices in sports. Our friend Ted Robinson is here. The game is sports. The game is on. Hi, I'm Kevin Mullen. And I'm Mark Simon. Welcome to the game. A new era begins for the 49ers in just a few weeks. Meanwhile, will the NFL recover from declining interest? What about all those night games in college football? Or the Olympians who had their medals revoked for failing drug tests? We're going to cover it all with someone who has covered it all, sportscaster Ted Robinson, the voice of the 49ers, veteran tennis play-by-play -play man, Olympics reporter, it's amazing you're here at all. You're always traveling somewhere. Ted, thank you for joining us. Well, Mark and Kevin, it's been too long, so it has been. thank it has you for been. having me back. Um, 49ers, as recently as in today, as, as of the, today's taping, there was a story in the Chronicle about, you know, is there a reason for optimism? And does optimism mean four or five wins versus whatever the heck yeah. they've been doing? Well, optimism to me is not about 2017 one lost record. I don't think it's going to be great. I'm trying purposely to scale <laughs> expectations down because the last two years have certainly left some scarring. Uh, but I think there's optimism from this standpoint. I feel better about where the 49ers are football-wise now than any time since 2011 at this time, which was when Jim Harbaugh came on board. And he and Trent Baalke and the organization were working together in 2011. It was also the lockout, remember, that year, so that everybody got kind of a late start. But my point was there was a collaborative effort in 2011. And this is the first time I think we've truly had that with the 49ers since then. Now, there's a significant difference. 2011, Jim Harbaugh inherited some really good talent yeah. that had not been well coached. And as a result that year, the mix was magic, get to the NFC Championship game. I think that's unrealistic <laughs> this year. But given some time, which six-year contracts mean Kyle uh, Shanahan and John Lynch are going to have time, uh, given time, they'll get this talent level back and give the 49ers their best chance to be at that level again, I think, since 2011. What is it about them? The, the, it sounds like you think these guys are doing things the right way. The abs well, they're working together. That's the biggest thing. It just, you know, unfortunately, over time, probably from 2012 on, there had been a little bit of a, what I call a peel. You know, coaching, front office, it kind of peeled away. And suddenly, not everybody was working as smoothly together as you wanted it to be. And the 49ers took a little bit of a swing last year, hoping that Chip Kelly could come in and reignite offense. And, of course, it, it completely crashed. It was defensively the worst season in the history of the franchise, 2-14. and 14. Uh, Honestly, they weren't that good, <laughs> which is really scary. Uh, there's more talent than that. And so hopefully that gets realized. Now, again... I'm really staying away from the expectation game this year in terms of four wins, six wins, eight wins. I don't think that's nearly as significant this year as how the team plays. Well coached, well oiled, prepared, and giving you the best chance to maximize what talent there is on the field. So the Lynch hiring as GM was a bit unorthodox because he hadn't had that kind of administrative or executive experience. Uh, is he going to be a real hands-on kind of a GM, or is he going to be kind of the face of the franchise in a way and delegate the personnel authority kind of below him in the organizational chart? What's your sense of that? Kevin, I think, I think both of that. He's hands-on. There's no question. I mean, he and <coughs> Kyle Shanahan, obviously, I think it's well known now. Kyle basically recommended John to Jed York, uh, who none of us know, and Jed didn't understand. John Lynch wants to be a GM. Wow. And John Lynch actually flew up here in January, spent some time with Jed York at Jed's home, and that's where they connected. And that's where Jed realized, okay, this will work. Um, John also attracted two very qualified personnel people to come work for him. Adam Peters, very credible from Denver, and Martin Mayhew, who had been the GM of the Lions. That hadn't happened around here for a while, where actually people with 
options and credibility said, I want to go work for the 49ers. So that magnet effect to me from John Lynch was a very strong statement of credibility. Again, all of this means there hasn't been a game played yet as we speak. <laughs> There's no one loss record yet as we speak. Um, but going forward, and I think the other element of this is I referenced the six-year contracts. Commitment by the team, acknowledgement by the team that they really didn't have a whole lot of leverage, right, coming off the last couple of years. So in order to get people who had options, Shanahan and Lynch, you had to make that kind of a commitment. It also means they're going to be here. And that's stability that this organization right now really needs. Well, 49er fans do have a history of being patient. When you think back to when uh, Bill Walsh first sure. came to work, and DeBerg was, DeBerg was still the quarterback. They were not very much good at winning, but they were at least watchable, which is the hardest thing about the team the last few years is that they've essentially been unwatchable. They're right. just so bad. Is there a parallel for Jed York and his uncle, Eddie, in that it took Eddie a few iterations to figure out who was the right team for him to have? And, and do you think Jed has sort of figured that out? Well, it, it's look, there's magic. And I, again, the Bill Walsh. I mean, it's not a fair comparison. Right, I that. understand. And that's exactly. So the Bill Walsh name is magic. It's uttered with reverence or still to this day in Santa Clara with great reason. Um, comparisons to Bill specifically are unfair, but there are some parallels in that it took Bill a couple of years to get the talent level to where in 81, which was Bill's third year, magic happened and bang, you, you win a Super Bowl. Um, Steve DeBerg was the quarterback when Bill started. Eerie parallel perhaps to Brian Hoyer. Brian Hoyer's an NFL quarterback, and he's had some success in some of his prior stops. Is he the long-term? No, he's not the long-term answer. I'm sure Bill would have said the same thing in 1979 and 1980 about Steve DeBerg. What happened? Bill found his long-term guy in the draft, Montana. That's where the 49ers this time next year need to be, I think. Need to have identified someone, even if he's not the starter in 2018, this is gonna be the guy we're gonna go long term with. So the, the phrase can be used as a derogatory phrase. I don't mean it this way, but this year, Brian Hoyer and Matt Barkley are placeholders. Mm -hmm. That's what they are. They're NFL quarterbacks. Brian Hoyer's a proven NFL starter. But is he gonna be the guy that's gonna take the 49ers to the Super Bowl? I don't think any of us would expect that. Yeah. It, it's coming at a time, uh, we referenced this at the top of the show, the numbers for the NFL are down, maybe for the first time in, in decades in terms of viewership and interest. At the same time, there's this huge controversy over concussions and related injuries. Why do you think that numbers are declining? Yeah. Uh, it's an interesting, I, I get asked this question a lot, and yeah. this is just my own theory from listening and asking questions of a lot of people around football. Uh, numbers went down last year, which was, the, it was so it's a one-year decline. Um, they're still massive. They're still way beyond any other sports numbers. I mean, when you compare what the World Series draws, what the NBA Finals draw, compared to a routine NFL week, it's, it's crazy how much the NFL survives. Now, is this one-year decline the beginning of a trend? That's what everybody in football should be concerned about. And there are two theories that, to me, collide. Last year, election, mm -hmm. campaign and election. There are a lot of people who believe the campaign and the election, which we've all lived through, siphoned some interest away. Second theory is the obvious one, the head issues, the safety issues. Um, and I think that's very real. And I think the NFL has been put on major red alert that you better address this. They have. Uh, we can all sit here and argue how well they've addressed it, but they are addressing it. Where we will begin to see it first long term, especially in an area like us here, urban area, more highly educated than other, I mean, just average education is higher than in other parts of the country, more rural parts. Football participation at youth level will start to suffer. I think we've already seen it here. Other parts of the country, in Texas, you think youth participation <laughs> in football is going to suffer? There'll always be a pipeline is what I'm saying for football. And it's wind up being places like that. Let me interrupt you for a second. We're going to take a quick break. Uh, stick around and you stick around too. We'll be right back. It's been over 150 years since Wells Fargo First opened for business. Since then, we've enjoyed your community support and we're passionate about returning it. Every day, Wells Fargo team members roll up their sleeves and donate their time to organizations and charitable groups throughout the Bay Area. Nationally, we've committed even more. 
In just the past two years alone, we've donated over $70 million to support schools and educational programs. It's a commitment we're proud of. Wells Fargo, the next stage. Welcome back to the game. I'm Mark Simon. He's Kevin Mullen. And over here is Ted Robinson, sportscaster par excellence, voice of the 49ers. And we were talking, uh, Kevin, about um, the declining numbers and how much of it's being driven by what's going on with the injuries and the head injuries. Just another report this week about sheer numbers of people who have long-term disabilities related to the injuries from lots, head trauma. Lots of attention on the violence of the game. Uh, NFL, it's still a, a massive industry uh, unto itself. But Ted, if you could sort of look into the crystal ball 20 years from now, does the NFL game itself look like it does today or will it naturally have to evolve to deal with the head injuries issue to become something of a different kind of a game? I, I think that's the, the second part, Kevin, I think <laughs> is where this will go. The league is still going to exist. The sport is way too popular, right. um, despite the fact it's becoming slightly more acknowledged today, but there is so much gambling <laughs> on sport in America. Football's the number one sport on which to gamble. It's not going away. Now, how the game's played on the field, I think, very much open to debate. Uh, there are people right here in our backyard in Silicon Valley that are investors that I know in technology to improve helmets. Uh, medical people up and down the West Coast are doing a lot of work to research what can be a safer protection for the head. Because the game can never be free from contact. I mean. It's no different than auto racing and then boxing and that the inherent nature of the sport, there will always be risk. Now, how do we minimize the risk? How do we minimize the long-term damage? That's what's happening. Um, second element to this, I think, will be um, my son. I, I was injured playing football in high school, flukishly, but a pretty significant injury. I was a parent that said, my kid will never play football. My son wanted to play high school football. He did. He ended up playing club-level full contact football in college. Loved it. Loved it. I always felt that there was a reasonable safety factor for him because the size of the players that he was playing against, both high school here on the peninsula and in college, were not massive. There weren't 300-pound crazy physical specimens hurtling themselves around and launching. That's where the game, I think, will change. And the other element to this is flag football. And Drew Brees is really leading a movement as as a prominent NFL quarterback to promote flag football. Mm -hmm. And I know people will hate me saying this, who were involved in Pop Warner, but that to me is what needs to go away. There's no reason for a young person to have to put on pads and a helmet at seven, eight, nine, ten years of age. Brains are still developing. There's no age. need for this. You can play flag football and learn essentials and fundamentals of the sport, which my son did through a fabulous coach, Bill Campbell on the peninsula, coached flag football for many, many years. And then in high school, when their bodies are more developed and they're stronger, can handle putting pads and helmets on for the first time. This, to me, is the absolute essential step for this football evolution. Let's talk a little bit about college football, which also seems bigger than ever. But for a long time, you had an association with Stanford football. Mm -hmm. They're playing all their games at night this year. And uh, it, it's making a lot of people very unhappy. They don't sell out all that well to begin with. But it's sort of, you know, there's that time-honored football, college football yeah. tradition of the tailgate in the eucalyptus grove at Stanford. Uh, what's your take on, on all the college night games? We, we all know it's because of a TV contract. Yeah. But, but it seems like it's taking the game away from the fans in some ways. I couldn't agree more. And I'm part of it. I work for the Pac-12 Network, so that, uh, and it's been frustrating for me to see on the front line of going to many of the schools in the conference, and when we get there for a Saturday night game, they're not happy. Coaches aren't happy. A lot of the administrators are not happy. The fans are not happy. The people that are happy are the students, by the way. Yeah. Students love, well, because you're a college kid. Saturday a night's cool. Yeah. Students like the Saturday night game. The players like the Saturday night game. Most of us grown-ups are the ones that don't like it. Uh, but it is, it's, a, to me, a significant problem, especially in the Pac-12 footprint, where we don't have the passionate fan bases that other parts of the country have for college football. And we said if Auburn and Alabama kicked off at 3 a.m. on a Sunday morning, there'd be 90,000 people in the stadium. If Stanford and Cal kicked off at 3 a.m. for the big game, there'd be 900 people in the stands, right? Yeah. And that's just the difference. So um, where the other factor in what you just talked about, Mark, though, is that at Stanford Stadium, they for years have dealt with the very thing that Levi Stadium has, that sun side of the field. Yeah. 
and I worked there 13 years, and when Stanford used to kick off day games in September and October, it was torture. Half the stadium, both the old Giant Bowl and the new stadium, you can't sit there. You get radiated by the sun. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the same issue is at Levi Stadium, and uh, the, the 49ers at some point are going to have to figure out a way to solve that. But you go around to Arizona, Arizona State, a little bit in the Los Angeles schools and definitely at Stanford, day games in September and October can't get played either. So there is there is a problem of what's the perfect time. And I joke about this, the Pac-12 jokes about it. I know every athletic director and coach would just say, if we could kick off every game at either 5 p.m. or 6 p.m., we'd be happy. <laughs> well, unfortunately, television won't let that happen. Mm -hmm. And the last part is that not surprisingly, if you know anything about television, the night games in the Pac-12 are very highly rated in other parts of the country, the late night folks mm -hmm. stay up, and there's no other games on. Yeah. It's the only game in town, so TV likes that. So, mm -hmm. so they'll stay with it. What is the shape of the Pac-12? It looks like it's becoming, once again, a very competitive league on a national level. Going to be a good quarterback. I should call it a league, I should call it a conference. Yeah, yeah. That's right. uh, it's going to be a good quarterback year. Yeah. And look, USC football is always going to be the signature program for Pac-12 football, and USC football is very strong right now, so that means the conference gets a little bit favor more favorable look around the country, even though Oregon is coming off a down year, changing coaches. Stanford lost two prominent, I mean, two of the top 10 players chosen in the draft this past year coming out of Stanford. But USC football is back. Yeah. And they've got the quarterback that everybody's going to want next year in the draft. That means the conference is in good shape. Uh, it's a great quarterback year. You have Sam Darnold at USC, Josh Rosen at UCLA that will both likely be high picks next year. And then a third quarterback, Luke Falk at Washington State, not as highly known, probably not as highly sought as Darnold and Rosen, but will still be a very good quarterback coming out in the draft next spring. Three in the conference, that's what people identify the Pac-12 with, right? Mm -hmm. Quarterbacks and receivers throwing the ball. Yeah, We're going to take another break. Stick around. We'll be right back. It's been over 150 years since Wells Fargo First opened for business. Since then, we've enjoyed your community support, and we're passionate about returning it. Every day, Wells Fargo team members roll up their sleeves and donate their time to organizations and charitable groups throughout the Bay Area. Nationally, we've committed even more. In just the past two years alone, we've donated over $70 million to support schools and educational programs. It's a commitment we're proud of. Wells Fargo, the next stage. Welcome back to the game. Mark Simon, Kevin Mullen over here, Ted Robinson. We're going to do the lightning round. All right. Uh, let's talk first about the Raiders. Alan Ludden? <laughs> uh, I just ooh, dated myself ooh, there. There you go. Password. Yeah. Uh, husband of Betty White. Yes, exactly. Um, the, the Raiders um, are leaving again. Can you believe it? It's shameful. I mean, my view. I'm sorry. It's just for, for this same ownership family, basically ownership, to move this team as many times as they haven't to jilt Oakland twice is just is just shameful. I'll also say what has completely been unreported to me is the whoever's coaching that team, if it's still Del Rio, when they get to Vegas, good luck mm -hmm. trying to keep your players in line. When you're the home team living in Vegas every night, good luck. You don't think there'll be a study in uh, personal self-discipline? Well, the, you, the, that organization is going to have to do massive diligence on any player they bring in. Seriously, self-discipline by the players on that team will be essential when they get there. Mm -hmm. So in our lightning round here, I just wanted to jump to tennis because I know this is your <laughs> in your wheelhouse. So Roger Federer, who seems like he's 100 years old, he's been around forever. Mm -hmm. um, just talk a little bit about what he has accomplished and um, you know, sort of who are the emerging stars that we need to be paying attention to going forward? Well, to me, the best sports story of 2017, as we sit here right now, is Roger Federer. The second best sports story of 2017 is Venus Williams. Yeah. What they have done at their ages in a sport that generally chews people up and spits them out by 30, Roger will be 36 in about a week. Venus just turned 37. It's remarkable. Um, Federer is... I'm going to say, I haven't really said this, but probably the greatest athlete I've ever seen hmm. and covered in broadcast in person. And I had a chance to call a lot of his championships to get to talk to him as much as you possibly can, a great tennis player. Um, 
he is extraordinary. He's a fabulous person, an incredible athlete. Um, he is, as I've often said, the quietest player I've ever heard. Fascinating, right? No grunting. He, but he literally floats as if it's that old air hockey game we had when we were kids, mm. that little thin film of air that allowed that disc to float along the top of the surface in air hockey. That's the way Federer plays tennis. And as a result, he's had, he's 36, he's had one surgery in a sport that's brutally grinding and physical. Yeah. Well, we're talking about tennis. Um, who's missing from the stage is Serena, and she's reached yeah. the point where all you need to do is say one name. Yeah. Um, any doubt in your mind, having had a kid, that she'll come back and be as good as she ever was? No doubt she'll come back, and little doubt that she can regain her top form. And right now, unfortunately for women's tennis, there hasn't been what you just asked, Kevin, about that emerging next group. There are some people that have come along, but they haven't yet been able to steal that throne from Serena. Sharapova's coming back. And again, Venus is 37, and she's in the top 10 in the world. That's staggering. But it also means that there hasn't been that consistent standout single or even group of players, which, by the way, is the same on the men's side. The men have had four players that have dominated for a decade, and really no one else has. You know, we've had guys that are up there, and they're knocking on the door, but no one's been able to bust through and start telling these older guys, hey, dude, it's time. Why do you Your think time's that is? Up. Part of it is the greatness of those four yeah. men. Some of it's just and talent. And it's obviously the extraordinary greatness of Serena. She's the greatest women's tennis player ever. There's no, there's no argument on that one. Um, part of it is that it, I think it's no different than other sports where knowledge about nutrition, conditioning, fitness, and then repair when you do get hurt is all greater than it's ever been. Thus, the ability to stay and play. Private air travel for those that can afford it, the great tennis players can afford reduces a lot of the travel wear and tear. Um, and then truly, they love the sport. Yeah. I mean, you can't do this if you don't, you can't do it like they're doing it if you don't love it. Venus has been battling an immune disease for five years, right? Yeah. An autoimmune disease, which we thought would knock her out fast. And she's still, she's managed this thing beautifully and still playing at a high level with it. Let me ask you a question that's really not on the lightning round, but it strikes me as you're talking about it. You see somebody like Phelps who wins all the time over an extended period of time. I think of Matt Biondi, who went something like eight yeah. years without losing a race. Right. You think of somebody like Federer. Are they that much better? Because sometimes they win by a little, sometimes they win by a lot. And I wonder how much of it is simply that desire to win is just that much greater than anybody else. Certainly, they wouldn't be there if they didn't have that. The, the, what makes Federer different is that he lost that aura. You know, there's an aura that you have when you win in any sport, okay? when. Uh, Randy Johnson was at his best in baseball, right? Left-hand hitters immediately said, I'm taking the night off. It was game over, yeah. I'm taking the night off. Nolan Ryan, it was guys had Nolan Ryan disease. It was <laughs> renowned in baseball that certain hitters just said, I'm, I'm not going to take my 0 for 4 tonight. I'll just take tonight off. Well, when Federer was at his prime, when Rafa Nadal was at his prime with Serena, the player is phys mentally beaten before they take the court. Well, Roger lost that. 2014, 2015, and last year. That's what makes this year's story so great. He has it back. Mm -hmm. He has it back. And as we sit here, there have been three of the four majors played in tennis this year. Federer's won two and Nadal's won one. 2017? Mm -hmm. That should be 2007, yeah. not 2017. That's why this is so amazing what they're doing. So Giants, A's, Warriors, quickly. <laughs> uh, Giants, do they? we're living through this brutal season, of course. Yeah. Do they break up the core that delivered... Uh, three championships. Is it really time to uh, do a uh, do a in, in legislative parlance? It's gut and amend. Can't really use that for yeah. a, 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 a <laughs> well, sports Rocha team. Famously said, "It's time to back up the truck." Yeah. Um, what do they do in the off season to turn this whole thing around? Yeah, I'm not sure what they can gut because you know the players are all pretty much on long term deals. Posey is the face of the franchise to me. You don't touch him. Uh, Matt Cain is probably finished at the end of this year after giving the Giants great stuff. I. I I fear for the Giants on two levels. One is that their team, if you look at the core of the team, it's, it's not old, but it's older. And it's all around 30, 30 plus, which means they're basically as good as they're going to be. Now, hopefully some of these guys like Crawford, Belt, Posey can maintain their level for a few more years. Pence is 34. That is going to happen. Mm -hmm. The point is that which leads me to point two, is they need that farm system to start developing. And I cringe because I worked there for nine years. I can only think in 25 years of one outfielder that the Giants have developed out of their own farm system. And that was Marvin Bernard. 
Wow. Yeah. Shocking. I mean, they need to develop outfield play. They need to bring athletes up. I mean, look, they brought up uh, uh, Posey, Crawford, Belt, and even Panic has been okay out of their farm system. Good credit to them. It's time to get an outfielder and somebody with that multi-tool skill that the Mike Trouts of the world, which is the one-time generational player, but someone like that has to come out of their system. Yeah, he mentioned the athletes. I want to skip to the Warriors, though. Just what your take is on the Warriors. We've huh. only got a minute left. Okay. I grew up in New York. Uh, I, as a kid, it was Walt Frazier, Bill Bradley, Dave DeBusher, Willis Reed. It was the way I thought basketball was supposed to be played. Then the game went up in the air, and none of us can relate to that. The Warriors, this Warrior team has brought the game back to where it was in the early 70s with those Knicks. That's the way the game should be played. The ball doesn't touch the floor very often. Everybody touches it. Everybody's apart. The game's played on the floor, not in the air. And there's obviously their skill level's extraordinary. And the fact that Iguodala's willing to come off the bench, extraordinary. Mm -hmm. The fact that Curry was willing to allow Durant to come in and still participate and be partners, unlike what's happening with LeBron James and Irving in Cleveland, extraordinary statements about Can them. anyone compete with them? Not right now. I don't see it. I'm, I'm an outsider like, like we all are as fans looking in, but no, th if this core stays together, which it appears it's going to, and they keep their heads in the right place, which they have for three years running now, no one touches them. Ted Robinson, thank you so much for being with us. Great to see you again. It's great to be back. Keep asking me. Guys. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not to worry. I'm Mark Simon. I'm Kevin Mullen. Thanks for being with us, and join us next time on The Game.